Thank you very much for that introduction and that welcome. It's a pleasure and a joy to see so many faces out there, not just my colleagues, but my friends, my bridge players, and my, no <laughs> my family uh, are watching online. Um, so I'm really pleased that you've managed to come out in the rain or you're tucked up somewhere at home. So I would like to start um, my lecture with a picture here of the great Robin Milner. And I had the pleasure of meeting him a few years before he died at a workshop that we were both attending on ubiquitous computing. And um, as you can see, Robin had a twinkle in his eye and he was very endearing and very approachable. And even though our areas of computer science are worlds apart, as you heard from Marta uh, the, um, and, and Abby uh, about his uh, work in theoretical computing and mine is about the human aspects, he was interested in how our minds could meet and to think about ubiquitous computing from the user experience, but also from the theoretical aspects and the design. And so we had uh, a number of conversations uh, about this. And so I'm very lucky to have met him. And in honor of Robin, I'm wearing an orange shirt like he is. <laughs> So um, my lecture today, I'm going to do it in three parts. First, I'm going to talk a bit about the early uh, stages of my career, uh, where I very much helped to um, inform um, the, the um, field of ubiquitous computing, and in particular, the, looking at how we can inspire children to learn. Then I'm going to talk about some research that I've been doing um, in the last two or three years, where we've been trying to design software to help people think more systematically. And finally, I'm going to finish by looking um, into the future about how we might develop new AI tools to facilitate uh, creativity. So at the start of my career, I was very much interested in how we could design new technology for children. And this is what we, we uh, were confronted with, rows of children sitting in front of PCs by themselves, following tasks, um, and you know, tried to get something finished. It was very dull and drill-based. And I thought, surely we can do better than that. There's this amazing technology that we're just discovering that's taking off the desktop. And this is where I got involved in an area called technology-enhanced learning. And what we tried to do was to think about how we might move computers out of the classroom and into the wild. And the reason for this is that kids get excited when they're outdoors, and we wanted to encourage them to have self, be more self-initiated in their thinking, to talk to each other, and to think about scientific inquiry in a much more um, en engaged way, and also to inspire um, curiosity. And so uh, one of the projects I'm most well known for is called The Ambient Wood, which we did 20 years ago now which was really a field trip with a difference. And this was work that was done with partners on the Equator um, uh, IRC project that was eight UK universities of like-minded, uh, daring to think differently researchers, of which one of them is Tom Rodden is in the audience here. Um, and part of this project was that we worked with um, uh, people from different disciplines, from design, from developmental psychology, from engineering, and from computer science. And we, we suddenly uh, felt like we were in a sweet shop, that we had been given all these new technologies to experiment with. And so we designed all manner of um, innovative technologies to help children really get inspired by using technology to think. And so we developed what were called probing devices, uh, where they could collect readings um, from the environment of moisture and light. We also made our very own handheld devices. This was before mobile phones were around. Uh, by which the, the students could um, get feedback and information whilst they were walking around um, outdoors in the woodland. And one of uh, my um, um, colleagues, Danielle Wild, created this, she was at the RCA at the time, she created this uh, periscope device down the bottom here, where the idea was that the children would come across it and a video would be played in the woodland rather than watching something in the classroom and then going out. So this was a David Attenborough video um, about the bluebell life cycle or something like that. And then they could see immediately, um, and, and that would whet their curiosity. So what we try to do then is to encourage um, learning through exploring and discovering. We didn't tell them explicitly what they had to do. We just gave them these tools that we'd built. And so go, go forth and experiment and see what you can find. 
And one of the things we were experimenting with at the time was what could we do with these new ubiquitous technologies? And so we talk, thought about allowing them to see the invisible and the inaudible, uh, whereby a physical action, this might be you walk past um, a flower, causes a digital event to occur. Now, this device down here looks pretty weird. Uh, it was what was called an ambient horn. And it would honk when it was going past something that would play a sound. So I'm just going to play you the sound that these two girls are listening to. And I want you to guess what it is. It's a butterfly drinking nectar. <laughs> Now you know. But we wanted them to, you know, things that you take for granted or you never really think about. We also had sounds for photosynthesis, what that might sound like. And this was, again, to try and get them curious, to think about these things. And we found when we let uh, children, they were aged 10 to 12, go out into this woodland, um, that much uh, self-initiated learning took place. And uh, we, we, we got them to go out in pairs so that they could talk to each other and, and collaborate. And with this probing device, uh, they probed everything, the air, the ground, the trees, and foliage. And what we discovered is, you know, kids being kids, they like to find the most extreme, the wettest, the lightest, the darkest. And they, of course, tested different parts of their own body to see whether they were the wettest, the lightest, and the darkest. And it was just a pleasure to see them enjoying that. And an important part of being uh, pairs is that one of the ch children would go and probe on, on the device, but then wouldn't have the reading immediately. They would then have to join the other child to have a look at, on the display and talk about um, what they'd found. And the, and the displays that we used were really, or the visualizations, really simple. Uh, so they could just see relative, oops, relative levels. And then that would trigger them to think where they might go and probe next. And here's two girls um, that are... Uh, are using uh, the devices together. And you can see how one does the probing and then the other reads out what the reading is. And then on the basis of that, they hypothesize where to go next, which would be even drier or even wetter. <laughs> So we couldn't stop them from going around testing things and thinking about why something was dark and light and whether something was even darker. Well, what little did they know was that um, once they'd been experimenting um, and exploring the woodland, they had to come back to the classroom. But the classroom wasn't uh, back at school. We made a pop-up uh, classroom, and you can see it on the left here, this rather yeah, um, stripy-looking um, tent. And we got the, the pairs of children to come back and share their experiences. And what they didn't realize is that every reading that they'd taken, every probe, we recorded it, and then uh, one of our software designers here then represented those on a bird's eye view of, of the woodland and where they'd been. And um, they could click on these dots and the reading that they'd taken would show and it would show the relative light or moisture level. They were absolutely fascinated uh, by this and were trying to predict which of the readings that they'd taken were moist or um, the, the moisture levels or the, the light levels. And this triggered um, a natural conversation between the children, um, and they were comparing you know, the different spare places in which they'd been um, exploring. And this led them to a hypothesize about the ecosystems um, in the woodland. For example, which plants grew in the wetter areas and why, and what creatures and insects thrived in different parts of the woodland. And just to show you, um, how different that type of um, learning is um, compared to what we were up against in the classroom. So I think I, I can be confident enough to say that at the time we pioneered um, a new way of, of designing technology to daring children to think differently. And it was hard work, as you can see here, uh, after a hard day's work. Um, but it brought us all together. And also we brought indoor and outdoor learning together in a novel way. And the children talked freely and excitedly with, with others, not just um, 
whilst that they were there in, in the ambient wood, but also on the bus back. And believe it or not, 10, 15 years later, uh, we came across some of these who were nice young adults, and they remembered their day in the ambient wood as one of the best days um, at school. Um, and um, they loved doing the scientific inquiry like this in the wild. But they were also fascinated uh, by the underlying technology. So at the time, this was a woodland of one of my colleagues where his wife used to do yoga. And so we had to wire it up, literally, um, and make our own Wi-Fi with aerials and put you know, laptops in trees for this. And they would, would go around just to try and find that technology as well, to try and work out how it was possible that things were pinging and noises were being made. Um, so that got them interested in the ubiquitous technology as well as um, trying to understand more about the ecosystems. So Mart has already said how um, uh, I contributed to the field of ubiquitous computing. And that doing this type of work uh, led me to think that the, that field of ubiquitous computing should be much more exciting and provocative and stimulating and engaging, and not how uh, it had been led to, you know, many people thought it should be following on from Mark Weiser's view, which is that it should be um, make our lives efficient, calm, and easy by doing things on our behalf. You know, the, the, the trouble with that is that, we, you know, we just get lazy. We just expect the technology to do it. And I think, really, technology is there to exercise our minds. And um, in particular, we should be designing engaging user experiences. And so for most of my career, that's what I've been doing, is trying to think about the different technologies that are out there uh, to encourage us to um, be more active, be more reflective in our learning, but also in our living and... Um, uh, oh, and our living, two lots of living there, and work, that should say, and to facilitate um, creativity. So that's part one of my talk and how um, it's inspired me throughout. 20 years on since the um, beginning of ubiquitous computing, there's been a lot of technology uh, that's been around and developed that we can experiment with. So we've had PCs for a long time, but now we've got tablets and various mobile devices. We've got what's called the Internet of Things, uh, which basically is putting sensors into uh, the environment, into objects, and connecting them to the Internet so that they can talk to each other. We've also got what are called tangibles and physical computing, where um, the computation is in some artifact, um, and this allows us to think, um, you know, how do we, um, you know, what do we want to do with the, the digital world um, in, in respect to the objects that are out there? And then there's augmented reality and virtual reality and wearables and speech interfaces and robots and chatbots and, of course, artificial intelligence and machine learning. And um, the question is, which of these technologies do we design for and how? And this gets me on to um, you know, thinking about thinking. There are many kinds of thinking that we can you know, use those different technologies to augment. So we're all involved in different aspects throughout our lives, whether it's planning, deciding what to do, choosing between alternatives, reasoning about things, making sense, reflecting on what's happening, contemplating, and solving problems. So how the hell do we match this up? How do we know which of these various technologies do we use to, to support these? We could possibly use PCs and tablets for supporting problem solving, but then again, we might want to use them for planning. We could use artificial intelligence to support decision making. We could use augmented reality to support reflecting. We could use tangible to support planning and so on and so forth. There really isn't any systematic uh, research or guidance out there as to how to make those decisions. And what we do in human-computer interaction is a bit of um, you know, trial and error and a bit of experimentation, but also we go to theory, particularly in psychology, to inspire us. And one theory I'm just going to mention, but there are many theories in which um, I've uh, looked at and been you know, inspired to think about how you design technologies is Daniel Kahneman's um, book on thinking fast and slow. How many of you have bought this book? I'm not going to ask if you've read it. <laughs> <laughs> I'd say 90% of you. It is a bestseller, and it's a really great title. But basically, in the book, he argues that there are two types of thinking systems. Uh, one which is intuitive, fast, it's no e effort, it's instinctive, automatic. And the other one is more effortful, it's slower, 
it's more orderly and deliberate. And he argues that um, system one is what routinely guides our thoughts and actions and is often right, but is prone to making errors, and uh, particularly those of judgment in decision making. Whereas system two is meant to be the voice of reason, and that he argues that we should employ this more uh, when we've detected bias in our thinking. Now, it's a rather uh, oversimplification of how thinking is, but when you're modeling, you do try and you know, think of how you contrast. And so to think of these two systems as alternating and that sometimes you know, our thinking might be somewhere in between. But it's a useful heuristic, a useful theory by which for us in human computer interaction to think of how could we stop people or reduce their um, you know, bad thinking or their biased thinking, and how we might promote what's called system two thinking. And this is, uh, having been inspired by reading this theory, what do we do next is we develop our own concepts uh, to inform the design of the technology. So this is where I've come up uh, with the um, collaboration of my um, students, in particular Leon, are you here, Leon? <laughs> yes, you're there, Reichert's. Um, a notion of scaffolded thinking. The idea here, just like scaffolding, is that you somehow use the technology to, to guide um, people and, and maybe stop them and slow them down to reflect more on, on their decisions. And I'm going to give a case study of where we think we can design technology uh, to support scaffolded thinking. And then the second one I'm going to talk about is what I'm calling integrated thinking. And this is uh, designing technology to help uh, people to externalize their thoughts, uh, to be more systematic when problem solving. So the first one, scaffolded thinking. And we think that we can um, use this concept to help us design technology to support people who invest in stocks. I don't know about you, but what you did during the pandemic, but apparently there was an astronomical uptake of trading apps. Any of you dabble in trading apps? There's a few of you who admit to it, but apparently over 130 million people have used them in 2021, and the most popular is Robin Hood. And these are designed for the novice uh, person who doesn't have much expertise. But many people new to investing have made costly mistakes. And what we wanted to do is to think about how we might design technology to uh, slow down their thinking and to help them so that they don't make these mistakes. So what happens when you've just invested in a stock and you, it goes up and then it goes stable and then you see this on your, on your phone? <laughs> you panic. You get really emotional. You get all sweaty. Your palms your hands go like this. You don't know what to do and you think, well, if I just leave it like that, I'm going to lose all my money. So you sell, but you often sell too much too fast and then you regret it later. And the problem with novice traders is they don't have a good strategy to deal with this situation. And this is where we come in, is to think how can we help novice traders to learn to think more methodically. This here is one of my PhD students here, Ava, who volunteered to be a model. Um, but is, you know, seeing that you get the stress and it's really difficult to think under stress. But professional traders um, develop the voice of reason. And they will have a set of questions and criteria they use before finalizing their trading decisions. They, unless they've had a couple of glasses of wine, um, uh, um, they will sort of maybe think through, is this the best thing to do? But beginner traders don't have this, and they make rash decisions. And so we wanted to help them to become more uh, experienced and expert by thinking through having this voice of reason and to scaffold it. Um, so that it stops them acting impulsively and also to think about what they're doing and why. And if you see over here to the right, these are the sorts of um, interior monologue or questions that we'd like them to be thinking through in a way in which some, many expert traders do. So things like, um, I, rather than I need to act fast, it's how did I come to this conclusion? Have you considered criteria X? Overall, this seems to be the best alternative. So having this sort of conversation with yourself and then you can decide whether it's a good to, to buy or to sell. So we decided to choose um, a chatbot for our technology intervention. And for those of you who are not familiar with chatbots, but I suspect most of you have, if you go onto British Gas or any of those banking sites, they now all have chatbots. It's essentially 
a virtual agent uh, that a person has a conversation with. So it can be customer services, marketing, sales, travel, and this one is travel, where the uh, user types in on the right uh, you know, a question and the chatbot will answer and then the user will, will then ask another question or answer it. So it's kind of having a simple conversation. And we designed our chatbot in this context um, here was to probe traders about their intentions and to help externalise uh, their hunches that, that aren't necessarily well thought through. So our chatbot is called a prober bot because essentially it's probing um, the, the user and asking them questions. And we designed it such that it would be embedded in the software so that the, as the user is, is looking at um, how well their stocks are doing and whether to sell or to buy, the ProBot will pop up at an opportune time and, and ask them questions. And here it says, if your investment hypothesis has changed, what made you change it? And the user types in the blue box, recent news. And so I'm going to show you how it works in action. And that we developed a, a software simulation for trading. And as you can see here, these on the left are the stock lists that the person has. And on the right, it shows the information and then this will pop up if they want to trade. And that's at the point when the trader bot pops up and says, what's your investment hypothesis? And this is to slow down and get them to think. And they'll type in an answer. And that may be enough for them to think about, is this, is this what I wanted to do? <coughs> so that's how it works. Just to uh, recap the design rationale, is that it pops up at key moments when the user is about to make a trade. It promotes short conversations with the user to stop, think, and reflect. And it's embedded in the trading tool so that it dovetails the task ex execution and the thinking. So how effective is our chatbot? Well, um, my um, student, Leon Reichertz, and, uh, ran a pilot study with six traders and presented three scenarios to them where they had to make investment decisions, whether to buy or to sell a stock. And then we used the HCI method of think aloud and in-depth interviews. I'm not going to go into the, the details. There is a paper out there if you're interested. But the idea was, um, would it make them stop and think? And from the think aloud, this, this was very much the case, that it did. Uh, very occasionally, it, got, it was annoying for it to pop up. Um, and that's something you know, that you have to design is not for it to become like Clippy when it keeps popping up too much. Um, but um, to encourage reflection on decision making by helping in the moment um, when it matters. And also they said that it would help reduce impulsive actions. So this suggests that this approach by having this type of chatbot appear uh, can make an investor's thinking more systematic. Now, I've talked about novice traders. What about expert traders, where they have only too much information, too much knowledge, and they can be tempted to be naughty? And this is the second case study that I want to present, which is financial institutions are responsible for detecting this naughtiness, which is essentially market abuse and trading, where, um, you know, someone who's got uh, confidential information uses that to their advantage. So here's a, a one that was in the news recently where an investor accuses Rocket Stan Gilbert of insider trading, claiming uh, that they had pocketed five, 500 million. A lot of this happens. Um, and uh, as I said, financial institutions try and stop it or try and detect it. And they employ compliance officers to do this. And their job is to detect this, but to do this by um, conducting investigations and curating and collating data from several sources by which to make up this and to see whether it's true. But it's an awful lot of work that's involved in being a compliance officer. And this is a hierarchical task analysis, which I'm not going to go through the different steps. I'm just going to show you that there are, oops, there are many steps involved in doing this. And there's a huge amount of cognitive work. Um, much multitasking. They have to scan through thousands of alerts, sift through millions of emails, and check lots of news feeds. And there's huge demands on their attention, constantly having to switch um, between various resources. And much of it is done inside the um, expert's head. And occasionally they might jot down their notes um, and their thoughts. What if they were given a new kind of software toolkit that could help them with this work and support more integrated thinking. 
And this is where I, I was working with a behavioral science team at NASDAQ uh, a couple of years ago, Wendy Jefferson, who I think is in the audience somewhere, and Anna Leslie. They both um, have left now and are co-founders of the startup called Let's Think. But what they did was to think about how you can develop what's called an investigative canvas, which is a set of software tools where disparate information can be brought together in one place. And rather than having to you know, go in and out of all of these different software tools, to have them there side by side and to help them to make um, and discover new connections. So there were lots of tools that they came up with, and the canvas was in the middle. There's the alert of the network, of the historian, the checker, and so on. And the way in which this was designed is that the um, compliance officer can decide which tools to bring together. So they start off um, with a blank um, canvas called the investigator canvas. And then on the top uh, there is the case builder where they can start to build up their case. They can put, uh, populate it with information that they found with potential alerts. Then they might want to bring up what's called the people profile. And this, by the way, this is an early design. Um, and here you can see what's going on between two people. What, you know, is there any strange um, communication or lots of communication that's happening? And so they can start to see there. And then they might want to build up, add another tool, which this tool here, is um, trading information that will be very useful for them um, when building up this picture. And over here is what is a scratch pad where you can bring information from the different tools and have it in place ready to add to the case builder. So I've given you an example of a few of the tools, but there are many others that were being developed. How effective is this approach? Well, I think our initial evaluations showed how it could be used by compliance officers to externalize their thoughts, but also project their sometimes random internal thoughts and make them more systematic. And also they could share it with other team members rather than just jotting it down on a notebook, enabling them to understand each other's lines of thinking and maybe collaborate. One of my PhD students described it as a whiteboard on steroids um, because it's allowing you to do so much more. You can discover new connections through having this set of side-by-side -side tools. And you can move the pieces of information, all the tools around, a bit like you do in Scrabble, and test hypotheses that come to mind. But also, it maybe enables you to think about something you may not have. And if you get distracted, you can pick up where you left off, because it's out there. So how generalizable is this approach? Um, well, we've been you know, noticing how others are now developing what are called orchestration platforms, where they take siloed data from multiple um, storage locations and organize it in a way that data analysts have it ready to hand. So there's a lot of interest in this new approach to thinking about integrated thinking. And the startup company, which I am part of as the CTO, um, is called letsthink.com. And if any of you are interested uh, or have areas where you think this approach would be useful, do get in touch. But we're trying to develop other kinds of Canvas tools in, in um, education, in finance. And our strap line is people to, enabling people to think brilliantly. So I want to recap. Uh, I've talked through two approaches by which we've used theory and HCI to think about designing um, tools to empower us. And I've shown how we can try to slow down people's thinking and we can scaffold and integrate um, their thoughts. We can externalize um, their cognition. And Marta mentioned one of the theories I developed because it's called external cognition, which I won't be going through today. Um, but that's been one of my uh, you know, contributions, is to think about how we can do that and what the design principles can be. We can also see new connections, and it can help us reason and reflect, and, uh, and in some cases reduce the biases in our decision making. And also, as we saw, there's the potential for supporting multitasking. So, matching technology type to thinking type still is very much uh, you know, an art form rather than a, than a science. But in some ways, it doesn't really matter. I think the key thing is the theory that you use by which to inform um, which of these and why. And just to recap, we turn that theory and it can be from psychology, it can be from behavioral economics, into concepts to inform the design of an interface. So um, I've come up with a numerous um, design principles throughout my career. And one I'm just going to mention is dyna linking. 
which is where you uh, link representations on different displays so that if you make a change to this one, it's, it's reflected or it's changed in that one. So that you can see by looking around uh, how, what the effects are of making a change. It might be a simulation or you might be building something up. And this type of diner linking is, is you know, really important when you're thinking about designing complex interfaces. We also look at all sorts of questions um, about the specifics of the interface. So should we use voice or text? What type of conversation? Should it be open? Should it be like, oops? Um, what type of feedback? No, not that type of feedback. Where to place information on the... Um, on the uh, display, and what kind of interactivity and how much. And so there are lots of questions that automatically come to us when we start thinking about new areas by which to design these um, technologies. I'm going to finish, though, uh, with thinking about the future. And um, we've heard about how Abby has changed her mind about how AI can make a difference and is very useful. And I believe very strongly that there's a a huge potential, and we're just seeing it, in AI changing um, how we think. I'm not going to go into the discussion about whether it's going to take over our jobs. I'll leave that for someone else. But I think um, it can support creative thinking, um, and um, in particular, um, in, in the sort of art and design. So what is creative thinking? Well, it involves us looking at things differently. Um, finding novel designs and, and solutions. And essentially, in a nutcase, it's um, making something new. So it could be a poem, it could be a picture, it could be a design, it could be a piece of music, a recipe, a dance, an app. And some of us find it quite difficult to, um, to be creative. So wouldn't it be wonderful if we could design AI tools to help us to discover new ways of being creative? And it is happening. This summer, I was amazed at just how many people were just talking about these new AI tools. And I suspect some of you out there have tried them. <laughs> they've, um, they've emerged to support creativity. And in particular, OpenAI um, have developed a process known as diffusion that turns text into images. So the user types in some words, for those of you who haven't tried it, um, into the box here, and then the AI tool generates images to match them. So DALI 2 is perhaps the best known one, but there are others uh, called Crayon, Mid Journey, and Stable Diffusion. So here you can see my first attempt was uh, I typed in blue sky sloths rainforest melting clocks, and that's what it came back with. I could never have come up with that. If you haven't tried one of these tools, uh, there's a big waiting list for, for many of them, but this one um, you can get onto straight away called Crayon. And it says, what do you want to see? And I first typed in, cat sat on a mat thinking. And you can think any sentence in there. And this is what it came back with. They're quite cute. Uh, some of them have got a bit squiffy eyes, and one of them looks like it's had its uh, uh, nose in the jam. But they're all sitting on a mat, and they look like they are thinking. So it's quite clever at how it does that matching uh, up. Perhaps the one that's the most advanced, though, is Dali 2. I first typed in um, a modern painting of a professor giving a lecture and being nervous, and it came back with four male professors. So I thought, that's not good. <laughs> so I typed in a modern painting of Yvonne Rogers giving a lecture and being nervous. And this is what it came back with. They don't really look like me, but, well, at least I don't think they look like me. But it certainly does look like... Um, uh, um, someone who's giving a lecture. The one on the right looks like they're quite angry rather than nervous. <laughs> but it's like you, you then want to write another sentence and you can't stop yourself using these. And there's massive appeal. So um, whoever I talk to is just really excited by these, whether they're artists, computer scientists, architects, designers, and the general public have all gone crazy using them. Why? And uh, it's good to have a look at one of the engineers who developed this by Adita Ramesh. said, Dali is a very useful assistant that amplifies what a person can normally do, but is really is dependent on the creativity of the person using it. And I couldn't agree more. And I've, I've made in red this word amplifies. It's not replacing. It's getting you to think again, well, what, what, what can I write now? Could it come up with something else? Some people might say, well, is this creativity? And I would argue yes. So when I typed in 
Dali, is Dali too creative? It came back with this lovely design there on the left. But each time we write a sentence or a few words, the AI tool makes us think of a new idea. And it enables us to dare to think differently. And some might say, well, it's, is it really an art form? And I was having a discussion in, in my lab this week. And we're saying, well, it's just like photography became a new form of creativity. So will this, two new, this new breed of AI apps. They've only just started to come out. In the next year or two, we'll see many more. Another debate, and it's not one for me to talk about here, but just to mention it, is, is it stealing the work of artists it uses in its training data? And can we find a way of compensating or paying for them? I want to finish, really, by saying, um, in the future, successful tools, AI tools, would be those that help you humans in their work. And just like the Probobot, which I talked about, the chatbot, uh, the most effective AI tools will be those that are embedded in other software tools so that they, you use them whilst you're doing uh, your task um, or your, your work. And just like the investigative canvas, I think the most powerful AI tools will be those that facilitate integrated thinking, enabling us to think and use more and more resources. And I want to end by, given that Microsoft are funding this, by a new Microsoft tool that I think is really exciting. And it's called Microsoft Designer. And um, I, unfortunately, there is a waiting list to, to get this, but hopefully um, not too, too, too long for me to get my hands on. But what it does is it, it uses DALI 2, so you can type in here with a description like kitten adoption day and it will come up with some designs and then you can use those designs in whatever it is that you're creating. So it might be a website, it might be a poster, it might be a newsletter, it might be social media. But here, again, it's embedding the tool in what you are doing. And here again, you can start with, oh no, it's the same one, let's do this one. Just add or remove content. So here they're creating a newsletter. And it's this, this idea that it makes it really easy for anyone to use and opens up many possibilities by which to um, think about new designs. Um, so I'm really excited by this tool, and I think there'll be many more that are coming out that actually match what we as, as um, human beings are doing rather than replacing us. So to conclude... I think there are a diversity of, of technology tools to think with, and I've just described a couple of them. And my field, human-computer interaction, has helped to design and shape those. And the most empowering tools are those that are embedded in ongoing user tasks and activities, especially those with a canvas that enable people to put things, move them around, and to discover and to explore and investigate and those that enable professionals and the general public uh, to extend how they create work. And I think the future is very much human AI thinking rather than AI replacing thinking. And I've always thought that. And I think the best tools will be there to empower us and to engage us and to excite us. So I'd like to thank Microsoft, the Royal Society, and the late Robert Milner for this award and also the many, many researchers who I've collaborated with. And I've only really mentioned those in the universities I've worked at and on Equator, but there are many others in other universities throughout the world. Without them, I wouldn't be here today. Um, so thank you very much. If your name's not on here and you're in the audience and you think it should be, <laughs> let me know. <laughs> thank you. Do you think the computer now does buy for our attention and, and do you think that's a positive thing? 
That's a very good question for those of you who didn't hear it. When we, I worked with Julie um, uh, on a project funded by Intel, and I was very much for making uh, technology be visible and engage us, and she was very much for the Mark Pfizer view of making it invisible and, and hidden. And now she's saying, has it not gone too far? You know, it's taking too much of our attention. And I would agree. I think there are, you know, some people have got, you know, really addicted to using their mobile phones far too much. And there are some very clever people out there who've designed some apps which, uh, and games and so on and so forth, which um, are difficult to put down. And um, I think the way to overcome that, like any sort of addictive uh, activities, whether it's uh, taking drugs or alcohol or eating too much food or all of the others, is we have to find ways to help people who find it really difficult. And there are uh, various software tools out there or uh, attempts to try and uh, you know, get people to stop. And sometimes they, you know, they're quite blunt instruments. And I think there's a lot of opportunity to help people to try and wean themselves off or to simply just throw their phone away. Um, but yes, uh, I agree. I think I'm, I'm probably uh, guilty myself sometimes of y using it too much. for the great lecture. During the lecture, you have shown two case studies which make use of chatbot and visualization, respectively, to make people think. What are your views on what kind of contexts each method could help people to think the best? Oh, that's a difficult one. Um, I think uh, chatbots uh, are, you know, can be used in a wide range of, of um, contexts and for different activities. So I mentioned one or two types that are used um, uh, in a sort of commercial um, domains, but also we were trying to think about how it can probe. But they've been used um, for other uh, applications and contexts. For example, there is a chatbot called Replica, which has been designed to help people um, in their well-being and get them to think um, and interact with it. So they've been used for, for different contexts. Um, in terms of visualizations, again, I think there are many application areas where you can use visualizations. And we've seen that in data analysis. And some of the work I'm currently um, engaged in is thinking about what types of data visualizations might we create for lifelong narratives for people and how they can reflect um, on different aspects of their life. And not just coming up with graphs, and, and, but think of what, you know, what other kinds of visualizations might there be. So I think, um, in, as I showed in that uh, slide, there are no uh, you know, hard and fast rules as to which type of technology you should use for which type of activity. It's obviously easier and cheaper to design for a, a mobile phone. And one of my colleagues who can't be here tonight um, was um, wrote a book called There's um, Not a Mobile App for That, uh, or something on that line, that everyone just goes straight to designing apps because it's easier to do. And I actually think that we, we, we can design um, technologies, um, a whole range of technologies, rather than just going for one that's easier and cheaper. Uh, hi, my name is Suyash. Uh, I'm a student at Goldsmiths College here, and I'm studying game design. And I'm looking to make specially uh, educational games, games that can teach kids about different subjects and different topics. So the slide that you showed about system one, system two thinking was really interesting because in games, a lot of it is about, you know, really fast reflexes, shooting, going around system one. And then with educational games, you want to ask them some question or make them think or learn something which engages the system two brain. But it, it makes the game less fun and uh, entertaining, and it makes it kind of boring. So how can one solve such a challenge of, like, uh, mixing both learning and while having fun? Um, I, I don't think system two is always boring, but maybe children see it as such. I think it's, it's meant to be a metaphor, uh, the system one and system two, and I think the, the key is to be able to alternate between those. So at certain points, 
they, you know, let them be fast and, and, and you know, um, just react. And, and at other times, you might want to slow them down so that they can be more strategic and get them to think about, is this the best way uh, to race or, to, or whatever else you're wanting to do in the educational game? And I think some early educational software was designed to try and, you know, combine different approaches and different strategies. So use it just as a heuristic rather than how can I get more system two? And to think, well, how can we alternate? You know, they've been playing really fast for a long time. Maybe it's a good time to give them an activity that will slow them down or get a chatbot that will say, is this the best thing? Maybe you should think of doing this. And to encourage what's called metacognition, which is thinking about your thinking rather than just constant reacting. So I think that would be my suggestion. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, everyone, for a really amazing, eye-opening talk. Um, uh, I have a question about the chatbot. Again, the system one and system two thinking, I find it that whole concept extremely interesting. Uh, so did you consider how to engage the users more with the chatbot? For example, in that system one thinking is presumably when the person is very overwhelmed with their own emotions. So they're either angry or very scared or very sad. Something really is happening. And then having something pop up in that moment, engaging, knowing that it's a robot, might just be immediately kind of the person might not consider even engaging with the chatbot. So did you consider what the chatbot could be doing? Like, could chatbot maybe be affecting emotions of the person, maybe creating a shock scenario, for example, or? Uh, where they show what could happen if they make this bad decision, or maybe inducing trust, or I mean, just kind of a question of how did you, what were the kind of different ideas of how, why would the person engage with chatbot in that moment of extreme? Um, that's a really good question, and I think our research in this area has only just begun. And uh, we started off looking into, first of all, we looked at how we could facilitate uh, teams of clinicians working together, sense making with data that it was, you know. Was they didn't really, underst not necessarily understand, but they didn't know what was causing the different trends. So we designed our chatbots to trigger uh, more conversation between the team. And it was very much thinking about how you can uh, you know, get more conversations going. Whereas the next tranche of research was looking at individual users and, and how you might get them to stop and think. So I think there's a huge scope for using chatbots um, that model, but maybe understand, uh, you know, the, the types of human emotions and tap into them. The key thing is you need to find a sweet spot because you can just annoy people and they'll switch them off and they become annoying or frustrating. And so that's where doing some, you know, good user testing can come in to help. Is this too much? And we, you know, our, and our first um, probe bot perhaps was a bit too in the face of of the trader. So we we reduced the amount of times and the conversation. Um, so, and, and the key is how long should the conversation be so that they can get back to the task. Um, if it's just that they, they want to explore their mental health or their emotions, you might have a much longer conversation, which is what Replica does. So I think there's a huge scope there for doing much more in this area and getting beyond the sort of Q&A model that's very much under much commercial use of chatbots. Um, thank you, Yvonne, for a really excellent and uh, informative lecture. I now begin to wonder whether this um, question follows neatly from uh, the preceding question. So one of the ways we scaffold thinking in society is through debate, challenge, criticism, a sort of quite scratchy way of engaging with people. So I'm interested in where that fits within, uh, within a model and how you can do that whilst remaining engaging. That's a tricky one um, because it, even in, you know, humans themselves can find that hard to, uh, to be all of those things um, when, you know, particularly in, in marriages uh, and understanding when it's best to say certain things, when it's good to be scratchy and when it's good to be blunt and open-ended. But I, I think uh, 
there's a lot of scope uh, for us moving, you know, I mean, there's been a lot of work in AI and natural language processing for quite simple conversations, but I think in the last year or two, there's been more understanding of the nature of conversations, the nature of these discussions that might go on. And so I don't have um, a, an answer to that other than more research um, into these things, but also for us to understand a bit better what goes on in these types of uh, discussions and, and scratchiness, as you call it, and, and do, do we have good um, understandings and theories about what goes on in human human conversations of this nature? And if so, can we bor you know, borrow from that and, and, and design these types of chatbots and, and other interventions to improve them? And certainly, uh, you know, at some of these very large government uh, meetings, it would be very powerful and useful to have maybe some of these chatbots to help. <laughs> okay, looking at the time, I think one, um, no, I will take these last two questions, so let's go there. Yeah, hi, uh, Adrian Gregory. I'm a business leader, so I'm getting, uh, coming at it from that aspect. So, look, really interesting uh, uh, presentation and lecture. I was just wondering, though, on your financial services example, it was about AI to um, slow down the thinking and scaffold the thinking. What about access to expert opinion? And then what did that open up in terms of regulatory requirements as well? So I'd imagine that was quite a tricky subject, but I'm really interested in your thoughts on that. Um, I think there's, there were two case studies. One is we were focusing very much on novice traders uh, where you know it was trying to get them to to develop new strategies and and to you know think about the criteria in the uh, financial world. Um, I, I'm not an expert on on the regulatory matters there as to um, how. Um, sorry, I wasn't sure what the part, second part of your question was. Yeah, yeah. I think grab the mic again. So you know, a lot of the AI you were talking yeah. about was around decision process. Yeah. Part of the decision process is access to expert opinion. Now, in financial services, expert opinion is regulated. Yeah. So, you know, it, it opens up. I mean, I imagine it's a complete minefield uh, because what I would want to do as an investor is say, well, okay, what do the experts think about this and how does that affect my decision making? How do I get access to it? But through the technology, I mean, the regulation would, I mean, it would be quite stifling in terms of how to get access to that. So I just wonder what your thoughts were and whether you yeah. came across that in your example. I think we steer clear of that because of those very reasons. If we have in, you know, information that others, competitors might you know, find very useful in, and we just give that freely out in our chatbots. And I think that we weren't trying to tap into you know, that expertise in order to, uh, to you know, let people interact with expert chatbots. It was more getting them to develop their own thinking strategies. But that's a, that's a very different um, area, I think, is, is to sort of work that. And I, I think we steered clear of that because it's a minefield. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, the last question there. Yeah. Um, this is probably a broad question, but I was wondering how such designs of decision support tools might be applied to um, more um, time constrained uh, settings like, like in healthcare where they're making kind of high stakes decisions and they're already cognitively overloaded and they may not have the cognitive resources at their disposal to make such systematic system two type of decisions. Um, yeah, just coming from a PhD student who's studying decision making. In, uh, I think MDPs. artificial intelligence has come a long way towards helping people, you know, under those types of conditions in, in decision making and in particular in diagnostic, um, diagnosing. And so, and they will continue to be developed to help. But the key is not to let them, you know, for, in my view, take over completely, but for uh, people in these situations to know when to trust them, when to use them and what they can do themselves or what they would like to do themselves. And that, I think, is what we call human AI, is in very much uh, one of the research areas that's happening at the moment, is, is to think about where you know, AI can replace certain activities. 
uh, that are time consuming or that can be unreliable and that you know for doctors and other clinicians can can use those but also to give them new tools that can empower them to be creative in ways which they they couldn't so i think there are two things one is as you said for people who are overworked or um, how can we help them but also those who are trying to think about the future of medicine how can we help them with these new types of creativity tools so i think there's a place for both stimulating questions and thanks Ivan for the great lecture and now I think I have the pleasure of actually giving <laughs> the award so oh, thank you Oh, and another scroll. Yeah. Wow, look at that. Thank yeah. you. Well, I will hang this somehow around my neck, but uh, not for the time being. But it's really, I, so I'm really, um, you know, words fail me. I'm, I'm just touched by uh, how so many of you are here. And uh, also for you to think that I'm worthy of this award. So thank you very much.